Good morning. Welcome to my kitchen. Uh, today I'm going to make some grits and um, I'm making real grits, old fashioned grits, uh, the kind that you have to boil for a while. So while they're boiling, it takes about 20 minutes while they're boiling, um, we're going to talk about different kinds of grits. And I also have a paper, and we can read part of the paper while we have some time. And then while we enjoy our grits, we can read some more. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to have to move. I'm going to have to move the camera down. I do apologize for that. And I'm going to turn on the light. Right up here, I have um, my lights. So I'm going to turn that on. And I'm going to move the camera down. here. I have a pot, a small pot, to make the grits. And I have a gas stove and I'm going to put it on um, medium to start. Actually to start to boil the water we're going to put it on high. Okay, so we've got, the, got that on. Let me move this back. Sorry. Alright, and I'm going to make one serving. So it takes one cup of water, which I have here, and we have to wait for the water to boil. And we need one quarter cup of grits, which is right here. Grits. These are Quaker old fashioned grits. Uh, and they do cook in about 20 minutes after the water boils. So, I'm going to measure one quarter cup, and I'm not going to add it until the water starts to boil. That's good. Now it's about a quarter cup. I'm going to put the lid back. comes in a little container like this, a little kind of a cardboard container. And it shouldn't take long for the water to boil. Looks like I got a little floater in there. It's a little piece of grit. <laughs> it, there's one grit. A grit. I'm gonna try to get it. <laughs> it's running from me. Take him out. Okay. And while I wait, no, it's almost there. There are different kinds of grits. You have the old fashioned, like this, and you also have uh, what's called quick grits. These cook in about five minutes. It's the same thing, but it's already uh, slightly processed, and they look like this. These are quick grits. And we also have instant grits, which look like this. This is um, the Walmart generic brand of quick grit, uh, instant grits, butter flavor. And they look like this, almost like flour. Right. But we're using old fashioned, and they're coarser. It's a coarser material. These have not been cooked. It's hominy. It's just been ground up. So, our water is boiling very nicely. So we're gonna turn it down now. We're gonna pour them in and stir them up. Now, just like with rice, after you add the grits, you turn the water, you turn the heat down to low. Stir them up really well. Make sure they're nice and, and mixed up. And I'm gonna put a lid on it down on the low setting. And you do have to check it periodically to make sure that they're you know, not sticking together, not sticking to the pan, not sticking to the pot. Because sometimes they will. 
So we just started that, have it on low, and I have a beautiful spoon rest here that I should use. I'm going to move these out of the way. I have this spoon rest. It's very heavy. It's made out of cast iron. It's made in North Carolina. Either cast iron. It's either cast iron or bronze. Um, and it looks like a leaf. It's a beautiful pattern. So I'm going to put this here. on it. Right there. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Now we're just going to let this cook. And for the paper today, I have the USA Today Weekend Edition, October 9th through 11th. Uh, we won't re really be able to get into it because uh, we will have to keep an eye on this, but we can see some of the headlines here. U.S. hero of French train attack stabbed. Chaos on Capitol Hill as McCarthy abruptly withdraws. Argentina adopts a clown wall to treat kids in hospitals. Uh, U.S. Russian missiles as Syria hit Iran. And there are other things in here, of course. And um, we'll certainly get back to that. When you go to take the lid off, you have to be careful. Because sometimes um, the steam will come out and it can burn your hand. So uh, I use a pot holder and I grab it and I pull it to the side. And these are cooking very quickly. You can see they're already much thicker than they were. And you just want to pull them away from the sides of the pot and make sure they don't stick. These cook, um, they do take longer to cook than instant grits. Basically, instant grits, you just pour in the hot water and they're done. You just mix them up and they're done. And I don't think I'm actually going to put the lid back on because these are cooking a lot faster than I thought they would. So we'll have the heat on, on low. Very low. And you do have to be careful because they will stick to the pot. And um, when you're ready to serve the grits, um, a good thing to do is to go ahead and get them all out of the pot. Because anything you leave in there after it cools, it will stick to the pot and it sticks like cement. It's very hard to loosen up. At the very least, you should um, add water to the pot and the water will prevent it from sticking. And I'm going to go ahead and just turn this off. That was really fast. I don't think I've ever had them cook that fast. Okay. These look great. Now we're going to let these set for a minute. And I'm going to, I have, I have my bowl here to put them in when they're ready. And I have some salt because I like salt in my grits. Some people add other things. You can add pepper or cheese if you like, um, or butter. Today I'm just going to add a little salt. I'm not going to put anything else in them. But you can see how, how, how creamy they are, how smooth, nice and hot. It's wonderful. I, you know, I can eat these anytime. I can eat these for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. They're very filling and satisfying, and I love them on a, a cold morning, like in the winter time. So, I think these are basically done. Uh, again, I, that, that's unusual. They don't normally cook that fast. So, what you do? I'm going to put my pot holder right here to avoid the clanking sound of the bowl. There. Pick up your pot. 
and scrape them away from the sides like that and you scoop it out into your bowl and this is considered one serving now grits are very um they don't have a lot of flavor all by themselves you know they, they really don't uh, which is why people like to add butter or cheese or salt because just by themselves they don't they don't have much flavor so now we're done with this the pot and the spoon so i'm gonna move these away your salt. It's still very hot. And you, you just salt it to taste. Usually I'll put a little bit on the top and I take my spoon and I stir it in like that. And then I'll add a little more. I know it looks like I'm I'm putting a lot, but the, not much comes out of that salt shaker at a time. So it's not a whole lot. Now it's very hot. As you can probably see all the steam coming off. Um, usually I will take a little taste at this point, And I end up burning my tongue most of the time. You blow on it. Mmm. Very good. It's wonderful. Not all Southerners like grits. Um, actually, neither one of my kids like grits. I, I've never cared for them. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you couldn't like them, but nice and warm. If you live in the um, United States, I don't even think you can get grits up north. No, I could be wrong. Uh, I know that there is a wider availability of different um, types of foods now than, say, 20 or 30 years ago. But when I lived in Illinois back in the uh, late 90s, I couldn't get grits anywhere up there. I didn't even know what grits were. They cool down and they are just fantastic. Mm mm mm. That's yummy. They're delicious. It's a very basic, simple food. And all it is is ground hominy, which is a type of corn. Um, and you can see the ingredients here. Um, oh, it might be a little bright. I'm going to turn my light down a little bit. You have white hominy grits made from corn, niacin, reduced iron, thiamine, mononitrate, riboflavin, and folic acid. And it's just basically ground up corn, a certain type of corn. So, I'm not really sure how I can spread out my paper to read here, but I don't want you to have to move anymore. <laughs> mm. I don't normally buy a paper and I don't have a subscription, but I decided what the heck, we'll get a paper and see what's in it. And right now, I'm basically just waiting for this to cool down. And I was thinking maybe I could just spread out the paper right here. And you don't want your grits to get cold. It's kind of like scrambled eggs. Once they get cold, they're really not good anymore. 
and you really can't reheat grits. You kind of have to eat them right when you make them. If you try to reheat them, they just, they're not good anymore at all. And they get, they get lumpy and kind of nasty. Kind of like oatmeal. Mm-hmm. Well, that hit the spot. So it's all gone. And normally I might eat that with um, some scrambled eggs or sausage or something. All right. Let's look at the paper. This is still a bit warm. <laughs> I'm going to just lay it over here. I'm sorry. I think I'm going to have to move you again. <laughs> sorry. Here we go. And I won't have time to read a whole lot. Oh, that's... Okay, I'll just turn the light back up a little bit. I won't have time to read a lot. I have a busy day, and I do have some things I need to try to get done. Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, gosh. You have to forgive me. I'm not used to reading here by the stove. Um, you know, it's the weekend, and I don't really want to get into reading anything serious right now. Let's go to something a little more lighthearted. How about... Look at the life section. That might be fun. remember not to, <laughs> I don't want to catch my paper on fire. <laughs> okay. If you're into um, The Walking Dead, which I've watched a little bit of, but I haven't really watched a lot of it. Um, here's an article about that. Dead marches into perilous new season. Uh, zombie walkers aren't going away. Sunday season six premiere features more than 600 of them shows big moments pulled from the popular graphic novels. There's no rest for the walking dead's weary. After the last season closed with an agitated Rick Grimes killing a resident of the walled Alexandria safe zone, his band of survivors and the domesticated Alexandria residents regrouped to face a giant zombie threat in the 90-minute season 6 premiere. It's one great beast that we have to wrangle, which I thought was a unique, brilliant way to start the season, says Lincoln whose Rick still bears cuts from his season five tangle. Sorry. Zombie walkers, more than 600 in Sunday's episode, a record, are one challenge. Vicious human wolves roam outside Alexandria's walls. Inside Rick's temporarily settled road warriors navigate an uneasy relationship with the softer permanent population. Rick also must resolve differences with longtime loyalists and deal with the new arrival of Morgan, a man he befriended in the show's pilot. We have groups of people that have transformed at different rates with different ways of surviving, all in the same place, says executive producer Robert Kirkman, who created the comic series that spawned cable TV's top-rated show. The people of Alexandria aren't quite as prepared for this world as Rick and his crew are. We also have wolves who are perhaps closer to Rick's group than they are to the people of Alexandria, but have a much more savage way of life. Expect more flashbacks this season. The premiere features two timelines, one in black and white that picks up immediately after the end of season five, and one in color that follows Rick and company as they prepare for a huge walker onslaught a few days later. Rick's group, often splintered, will band together this season and Alexandria will remain a pretty integral part of the show for the foreseeable future, says Kirkman. Characters from the comics include Heath and Dr. Denise Cloyd, uh, including Heath and Dr. Denise Cloyd, will be introduced in the series. Season 6 has a vast amount of big moments pulled from the comics, Kirkman says. The two are very closely tied at this point. Dead averaged 20.1 million viewers last season, ranking as TV's top show among young adults. So Kirkman sees no end in sight for the show, 
which spawned a Fear of the Walking Dead spinoff. Kirkman says he's optimistic we will get to tell this long, sprawling, apocalyptic story until its natural conclusion. I definitely have an end game, but it's something that's very far off. That sounds good. Okay. And we're going to read th uh, this about the movies. Uh, Apple upgrade. Jobs put Fassbender in Oscar race lead. And this is Michael Fassbender. Steve Jobs put thousands of songs in our pocket and many computers in our ears. Could he put an Oscar statue on Michael Fassbender's mantle? Audiences are about to discover that Steve Jobs, opening Friday in New York and Los Angeles, nationwide October 23rd, is an atypical biopic. Screenwriter Aaron Sorkin of The Social Network and Moneyball crafted the controversial tech icon's life in th into three defined acts, each surrounding pivotal project launches. It's a fresh and different take, says Fandango.com chief correspondent Dave Carger. The risk really pays off. The consensus in Hollywood is that the actor's deft embodiment of the mercurial tech giant is stunning, despite the fact that Fassbender looks nothing like Jobs, who died in 2011, and is set to propel Fassbender to the top of the Oscar race. I think the best actor race is over, personally, says GoldDerby.com founder Tom O'Neill. Michael Fassbender has everything he needs to win Best Actor. Statistics on Gold Derby, an awards prognosticating site, favor Fassbender over Johnny Depp for Black Mass, Eddie Redmayne for The Danish Girl, Michael Caine for Youth, Leonardo DiCaprio for The, Reven uh, the Revenant, Brian Cranston for Trumbo, and Matt Damon for The Martian. A Academy Awards voters historically fall hard for A-listers playing famous people. Think Meryl Streep becoming Margaret Thatcher in The Iron Lady, or Helen Mirren ruling as Elizabeth II in The Queen. That is the kind of huge physical transformation they like to reward, says O'Neill. The only hiccup Fassbender faces is a lack of heroics. His jobs, much like the man depicted in Walter Isaacson's authorized biography on which the screenplay is based, is both a brilliant industry dis disruptor and a cold millionaire who refuses to claim his eldest daughter, Lisa, despite the proof of a paternity test. In short, in Steve Jobs, Jobs is a jerk. While a rabid fan base propels the film forward, Steve Jobs is doing a better job of captivating younger and social savvy audiences than your usual biopic, says Togi, Toby Balkadhaj, co-founder of fan entertainment site MoviePilot.com noting that the movie already has stirred up more chatter than the theory of everything in the imitation game had before their releases last fall. In fact, the biggest obstacle to a win may be Fassbender himself. The actor, last nominated for supporting actor for his depraved slave owner in 12 Years a Slave, has famously declined to campaign in the past. He's not going to kiss babies in Beverly Hills, but Meryl Streep didn't do that, said o says O'Neill. He's going to do the basic job that's necessary. A successful campaign may bring more than a statue. Steve Jobs could finally hardwire Fassbender as a household name. If he does become the best actor front-runner, this helps his star power more than anything he's done, says Carker. I'd really like to see that. Unfortunately, um, for me, when it comes to movies, I have trouble going to movie theaters because I have uh, misophonia, which is um, literally translates into hatred of sound, and one of my misophonia triggers is the sound of people chewing loudly uh, with their mouth open, and to me, when I go in a movie theater and I hear people eating popcorn, they always sound like they're starving to death, and they chew with their mouth open, and it just infuriates me to the point that I've had to leave before, because it, 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 it um, triggers rage in me to the point that I cannot sit there I, I can't, literally can't. It doesn't irritate me, and it makes me furious. So I'll probably wait until that is out uh, on Redbox or, or whatever. I probably won't see it in the theater. Now let's see. Looks like we've got some other stuff here. We've got um, Chicago's Urban Renaissance. I used to live near Chicago. I did. I lived up there for about a year, uh, about an hour, uh, an hour north on the, on the train, on the metro. Uh, I'll, I'll read this, and 
and that might be about all I have time to do. Okay, South Side Story, Chicago's Urban Renaissance. There's a reason the Mars, the Marzeg, Marzecki, I'm sorry, I, we don't have names like that in the South, I never know how to pronounce them. Marzuki family included the word community in the name of their Bridgeport bar in South Side Chicago. There's more of a neighborhood feel. Mark, my, Mike Marzuki, sorry, Marzuki, owner of Maria's Packaged Goods and Community Bar, says of Bridgeport, when I lived on the north side, I didn't know my neighbors. He knows his neighbors now, and he's determined to invest in the Bridgeport neighborhood. His mother, Maria, the namesake of the bar, took over the property in 1987 when it was Kaplan's Liquors. In that time, it has changed from a tavern and packaged goods store to a craft beer and cocktail magnet for locals and hipsters, a destination bar. We call it the community of the future, Marzuski says of Bridgeport. The south side of Chicago has, a, has had a reputation for being gritty and crime infested, but many of its neighborhoods are evolving into livable communities that are drawing people from the usual attractions downtown. The announcement that President Barack Obama will have his library and museum built in the south side of Chicago is a testament to the growing influence of communities such as Bridgeport, traditionally a working class neighborhood in nearby Hyde Park, which houses the prestigious University of Chicago. Officials have yet to decide the exact location of the library, but the contenders are Washington Park and Jackson Park near the University of Chicago, where Obama once taught. The Obamas have a home on the border of Kenwood and Hyde Park. The culinary scene in the area is flourishing and new breweries and entertainment venues are popping up. A burgeoning arts scene is attracting culturally minded visitors as well. The south side of Chicago has had a reputation for being gritty and crime fest infested, but many of its neighborhoods are evolving into vibrant communities that are drawing people from the usual attractions downtown. The whole south side gets labeled as the dangerous section of the city, and that's just not the case, said Jason, oh lord, here's another one, Lesniewick, I'm so sorry, Lesniewick, I can't read it, sorry, I'm so sorry. I don't read any of this beforehand. I never know what I'm going to encounter. Culture, we'll just call him Jason. The, the cultural tourism manager for Choose Chicago, Chicago, the tourism authority for the city. Hyde Park traditionally has been a stable bedroom community, yet a culinary renaissance is giving it a vibrant commercial base that it had very little of before. Chef Matthias Merges, who worked at the famed Charlie Trotter's, chose Hyde Park to expand his culinary empire. In recent years, opening Japanese-inspired Yusho in Northern Italian A10. Merges says Hyde Park, Hyde Park was a gastronomic wasteland when he arrived. People thought we were nuts to come down here, he says, over a lunch, a lunch at Yusho that includes cornmeal crusted oyster steamed buns and french fries loaded with ginger and spicy aioli. It turned out to be a positive thing for us. After lunch, he takes me on a tour of the neighborhood, probably best known for the university and the Frank Lloyd Wright uh, design Roby House. Construction cranes are everywhere. The library is going to be a big cha game changer, he says. The University of Chicago will have a role in running the Obama Library and Museum. Judging by the museums they already have on the campus, it's a good choice. The Oriental Institute was founded in 1919 and has an impressive collection of antiquities from Egypt, Iran, Syria, and other countries in that region. Six miles away, the Bridgeport neighborhood is drawing artists as well as chefs. On a recent afternoon in Bridgeport, the Zuby Arts Center is buzzing. The sprawling complex houses 40 studios. Brothers Dewang Zhu and Shan, Shan Zhu, both artists who moved to Bridgeport from China in 1986, opened the center in what used to be a factory in 2004. The duo thought it would be good to bring artists together and would also and also would be good for the development and culture of the neighborhood, says Dewang Zhu. Artist Amy Donaldson was searching for an up-and-coming arts district when she decided to move to Chicago from Florida. She settled into the Zuby Art Center two years ago. I'm excited to see what's next, she says of Bridgeport. It's definitely going to be the next art mecca of Chicago. It's a destination that few would have uh, few would have thought Bridgeport would achieve decades ago. 
when it was fraught with racial tensions. The neighborhood also has been home to five mayors, including two members of the famous uh, daily political parley, party no, family. Over the years, affordable housing prices have attracted immigrants from China and Europe, making Bridgeport one of the most ethnically diverse neighborhoods in the city. There's a new contemporary culture, says Ed Marzuski, Mike's brother and owner of Mars Community Brewing, a craft beer producer. Five years ago, the brothers decided to redo Kaplan's Liquors. While it remains a classic, slashy, half liquor store, half neighborhood tavern, it now has a more stylish look. On a recent evening, a chalkboard advertises Bartender's Choice for $4. It's a roll of the dice, says Ken Zawacki. <laughs> what is with these people's names? I decided not to roll the dice and order the Marzuski Mule and gin with ginger beer, Laird's vodka, and organic lime juice. There's so much possibility, Ed Marzuski says. I always believe you can do anything you want in Chicago, but you have a better chance of doing it in your own neighborhood. Kevin Hickey certainly believed so when he opened Duck Inn nine months ago. The chef grew up in Bridgeport but moved away, working in cities such as San Francisco and London. When he decided to open a restaurant in Bridgeport, he took over a corner building that had been a neighborhood tavern since the early 1900s. His goal was to create a restaurant where locals and visitors can have an affordable meal on the casual patio or splurge on fancier fare in the upscale dining room. It seemed like a great opportunity and timing for the neighborhood, he says. Bridgeport reminds me of Brooklyn five or ten years ago. Oh, sorry, we have Selena Gomez and the crossword puzzle. And some more information about uh, TV shows. And here it looks like uh, airplay charts. Urban, Country, Rhythmic, Hot Adult Contemporary, Adult Contemporary, Urban Adult Contemporary, Christian, Alternative, alter, uh, Active Rock, Adult Rock, and Latin. And here we have a little article. Um, and we will read this, and then um, it'll probably be where I have to stop. <clears throat> and I apologize for all my giggling. I'm sorry. I'm a little, I'm a little punchy this morning. I'm not really sure why. Okay, song of the week. Paul McCartney, Michael Jackson, together again, but different. Paul McCartney and Michael Jackson have quite a history. First as collaborators, pairing up for a pair of early 80s singles, The Goofy, The Girl Is Mine, and The Groovy, Say, Say, Say. And then as rivals, after Jackson famously outbid McCartney in 1985 for the rights to the Beatles' back catalog. Now, six years after Jackson's death, Maka is breathing some new life into Say with an upbeat remix featuring previously unheard vocals from the two kings of pop. Unveiled in a brand new music video on McCartney's Facebook page, the 21st century edition of the 1983 single swaps the singer's parts, splicing together two unused vo uh, lead vocal performances to give Jackson, not McCartney, the opening lines of the song, Say, 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 What You Want but don't play games with my affection. Find the remix, along with other hidden McCartney gems, on a new reissue of Pipes of Peace out now. And this little article includes a picture of Paul McCartney and Michael Jackson on December 19th, 1983. So, and this is the live section from USA Today, the weekend edition. of it. Uh, uh, I, I hope that you liked it, and I hope you have a wonderful day and a wonderful weekend, and I'll see you again.